Morning, Anchor Church. It's great to see you all this morning. We invite you to stand up and worship. The battle belongs to him this morning. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Let's fight on our knees this morning. So when I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I'll lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. All I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is the cross, God, you see an empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands. The battle belongs to you in every fear. I'll lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Shot in the shadows, win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shot in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you In every fear, I'll lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you Oh God, the battle belongs to you Well, good morning, Anchor. You can have a quick seat. Uh, at this time, we're going to prepare to receive the morning offering. 
Uh, so if you'd like to give to the ministry of Anchor, now's the time to prepare to do that. And I also have a few quick announcements for you. Uh, first of all, we have a huge fall party uh, on Halloween night. During the trick-or-treat hours, we just invite the whole community to come in here. We give them a meal. We have games for them, all kinds of things for the kids uh, to come and have fun. And we've got sign-up sheets. Uh, if you want to pass those around and uh, if you can get those two passing around, uh, we'll have that happen. You can think about that. You've got a few weeks uh, to think about what you can do to, to join into this huge event. It's our biggest event of the year. Uh, we have hundreds of people that show up on that night. So uh, think about how you can help, help out that way. Looks like the ushers are ready, so pray with me, please. Father God, you are good. You are mighty and strong, and, and we thank you, Lord, that the battle does indeed belong to you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to lay our burdens, our troubles, our thoughts, our weary minds, whatever it is, help us to lay those at your feet and to trust you with them now. Lord, we are here to praise and worship you. Lord, we are here to offer our all to you. Be with us, speak to us, guide us, heal us, Lord. And let us be a light that shines out. Use each of us. Use the resources, use the offering, use whatever you want to use, Lord, so that we could be a blessing to one another and be a blessing to this community. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, you can come forward. Uh, so uh, while those sign-up sheets go around, just a couple other things. We have a membership class today. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member of Anchor Community Church, we'll meet right here in the sanctuary after service, uh, probably about 10 minutes after service ends. Uh, we'll meet here in the sanctuary. Uh, so stay after today if you're interested in becoming a member. Uh, we have our new high school, middle school program happening after our song set here. They'll go downstairs, and our kitchen remodel is making fantastic progress. Uh, let's give Steve and uh, his crew uh, a round of applause. It is looking so good down there, but they're not done yet, so stay out of the kitchen. I know you want to see. I know you want to check it out, but stay out of the kitchen. Don't mess things up. Let them finish. Uh, they'll be finished here before we know it, and we can all enjoy that together. All right, if you would, stand up again, and we can sing uh, and praise together. This is a new one for us. all the hosts of heaven who else can make every king bow down who else can whisper in darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty demands such praises what other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him. Come and behold him, the one man, the Their glory consumes like fire. What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Oh, come and, oh, come and behold him, the one man, the only. 
sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship our holy God. Oh, come again. Oh, come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship our holy God. could rescue me from my failing who else could offer his only son Amen. who else invites me to call him father only a holy God only a holy God only a holy God Amen oh, come and be the one and the only cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship our holy God. Come and worship our holy God. Amen. This week we're going to look again at Christ as our example and his holiness is his one of his greatest credentials and we want to really accentuate that and focus on that this week as we reflect there's power in his name there is power in the name of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus, to break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain. Let's sing that again. There is power in the name Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus, to break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. Break every chain. He's a sufficient sacrifice. All sufficient sacrifice. So freely given, such a price. But our redemption, heaven's gates swing wide. There is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain. There's an army rising up. There's an army. There's an army 
break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. It's to break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Amen, church. Well, good morning again. If you don't know, I'm Pastor Kevin. We're excited to have you with us today. Uh, we are in a series uh, looking at the book of 1 Thessalonians, and today we're in chapter 2. So Scott is going to uh, read for us from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. That was a mouthful there, but Scott, go ahead. I will be reading verses 1 through 13 and then 17 through 20. Verse 1. Of 1 Thessalonians 2. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Verse 17. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Thank you, Scott. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, high school and middle school, you guys can head downstairs uh, for your class with Landon at this time. Um, you know, 1 Thessalonians is, is cool. It's, it's full of information. It teaches us a lot. It's going to show us how to be like a rock in our personal lives and in our community here as a church. And one of the things I like best about it is it's really short. Uh, it's really short. So you, you guys can read through 
1 Thessalonians today if you wanted, right? You could you can read through this book pretty quick. You can get a good grasp on it. Uh, you can start thinking it through. Uh, you know, Scott just read almost all of chapter 2 for us right there. So don't be afraid of, of 1 Thessalonians. Dive in and, and get to know this book. This little book wants to help us become solid and strong in our faith like a rock, like a rock, just like Bob Seeger tells us, right? Paul wrote this letter to that church because they were struggling. They were facing tough times. They were being persecuted. They were being arrested. Uh, some of them were even being killed for their faith. In their faithfulness and endurance, Paul sees that and he encourages it. He wants to bless them and help them move forward even through tough times to trust Jesus when they need to most. So if there's anything you need, if there's something that you want to be, if there's something that your, your family needs you to be, that your, your friends need you to be, or that your brothers and sisters here at church need you to be, it's to be this, to be solid, strong, settled in your faith, like a rock, trusting in Jesus. Last week, we talked about chapter one a lot, and we kind of jumped around a bit, but we talked about what it looks like to develop character and who we let influence us in our lives. We talked about how we need to find the right examples of people who we can follow, we should follow. And we, we looked at Paul. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And that we want to look for those kind of people, those kind of leaders in our life, people who are a step or two ahead, people full of wisdom and love and kindness, people who can stay humble and people who are centered on the rock of Jesus. And then my final challenge was for you to become that kind of person yourself, to be an example for others to follow. Those ideas continue on in chapter 2 as well. So today I want to look at a different idea. I want to look at the people who are in your life, your community, your friends, your, um, your homies, yeah, your, your posse, your crew, whatever you want to call it, right? Your people, your people. Who is your people? Who is part of your life? Who do you do life with? Who do you have that deeper connection with? When you read through 1 Thessalonians, it's easy to see that Paul had that kind of relationship with the church there, with the church in this city. They weren't just friendly to one another. Paul didn't just drop in and say, hey, here's some news about Jesus. They really loved each other. They grew to know each other and care for one another. They hit it off right away. They became dear friends. They became members of the same family. They were like brothers and sisters. This isn't just an example of how leaders should feel about people they serve. This is an example for all of us, for all believers, how we should feel towards one another. When Paul talks about the deep affection he has for the folks in Thessalonica, we need to understand that this letter, these verses, it wasn't just about his relationship with them but it was about the kind of relationship we are to have with one another. It's an example, an example for us of how much we can love one another. Jesus said this a lot. John 15, Jesus says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. It's why he said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you, what? Love. By this, they'll know. They'll know what you're about. They'll know who you're following by love, if you love one another. We are called to love one another. You know, I remember when I was a, a young college student uh, learning about ministry for the first time at Huntington University and, and talking through with some of the guys about our ideas for what church could be like, what kind of church would we want to go to, what kind of church would we maybe one day start Tim Hallman happened to be one of those guys, by the way. Some of the ideas we came up with were, uh, well, first of all, we'd have services at night. I mean, no more of this early morning stuff. We didn't like mornings. 
You know, we were college students, so just forget that. And second, we would have a rocking band, right? I mean, we would crank up the music, and we would, of course, play songs that I like. That, that was most important, that I like them. Third, there would be no, no announcements ever. We just, no one else, forget that. Fourth, the preacher would be amazing. The preacher would be a brilliant communicator. Five, the church would have just one service a week. You could come and be a part of this amazing experience, and it would only take an hour of your week, right? You'd come in, you could sing, you could pray, you could give, you could hear an amazing sermon, and then go home. Not worry about it till next Sunday. You don't have to go to a bunch of meetings or small groups or events. Just a great worship service once a week. That's it. Sounded good at the time. Now, I want to say a couple things about that, though. I didn't really know what I was talking about. I mean, I was pretty young, pretty green back then. And the other thing I want to say is that, unfortunately, some churches have actually followed this model. Some churches think, yeah, that's the model we need. All their energy goes into making a great service once a week. Once a week for an hour, we're just going to wow people with uh, fantastic music and videos and drama and pyrotechnics, you know, whatever it takes, we're going to get the wow factor going. But if that's all they do, they're missing out on a lot. You see, in that scenario, you come... You sit, you, you listen, and you leave. Sure, maybe you sing a few songs, but you're in a big crowd. You don't have to know anybody. You don't have to talk to anybody if you don't want. And when it's over, you can walk out the door, and, and that's it for the week. Or maybe longer. I mean, maybe you'll come back next week. Maybe you won't. And that's okay because no one will notice if you were there or not. And some folks are looking for that. I think a lot of folks are looking for that. I'm not saying that all big churches are bad. They're, they're not. A well-planned, a, a highly executed worship service, those are, are great things. It, it's really cool. But I'm saying that it's not enough. On its own, that is not enough. The Lord doesn't want us to get lost in the crowd. He doesn't want us to come and go and never connect with anybody on a personal level. No, the church is meant to be much, much more than that. As most big church pastors, <laughs> they would say the same thing. They're not clueless. They know this is an issue. That's why they're trying to constantly come up with ideas to build community, to have small groups and, and programs to fight against that. Because God's plan for the church isn't for it to be like a concert. God's plan for the church isn't for it to be like a, a once-a-week self-help seminar. It's much more than that. The church we see in the New Testament, you know, it's more like a team. Uh, I pictured a soccer team here, it's a soccer team getting together, practicing and playing the big game and, and, and celebrating afterwards at the local pub, right? They're just enjoying each other. I, I don't know if you've seen Ted Lasso or not, but uh, it's got some great characters in there. And you see this soccer team, they have the same goal, they're, they're working together on purpose and you see them take care of each other along the way. In the 1980s, watching television, if, if you were alive, I know some of you weren't alive, you would remember the same kind of thing happening, a, a caring community that happened in a, in a show called Cheers. Sometimes, sometimes friends and people at the local bar get this more right than the church does. And that, it just shouldn't be that way. God hasn't called us to come sit, listen, and leave. He's called us to do more, to be more, to connect. Sometimes, sometimes the folks at the bar get this right. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, right? 
And they're always glad you came. <laughs> hey, Norm! Isn't that... Uh, I'm not telling you guys to all leave here and go to the bar. <laughs> but don't you want that feeling? Don't you want that feeling when you walk in someplace? They know my name. I belong here. I matter here. That is part of what God wants for us in the church. That is part of the relationship we see that Paul has with the Thessalonians, a sense of belonging. You know, let me just be clear. I'm not saying that there is a problem in every big church out there. The truth is there's a problem in every church out there, whether they're big, small, or somewhere in between. The problem is that when churches, whether they're big or small, when we just go through the motions, when we kind of tap out, when we just put our time in, when people think they can come and just sit and listen and leave, and we miss out on those personal connections. That can happen anywhere. It can happen here. And that kind of mindset, it leads to isolation. That isolation that affected us all so much through the pandemic. That isolation that, that we're still paying the price for in a lot of ways. This is not what the church was meant to be, though. If you want to grow strong like a rock... If you want to develop that strong character, that foundation with Jesus, you need a Christian community to support you. We need one another. The other side of this, there's always the other side of the corn, right? Is there is a sense in which, which your faith is your own. You are on your own a bit in your faith. I mean, you're responsible for your faith. Your faith is, is up to you. Nobody else can do it for you. Nobody else can accept Jesus for you. Nobody else can uh, pray when you need to pray. Nobody else can make the decisions that you need to make to grow in your Christian life. You can't blame anybody else for the sins that you choose to go after. You're responsible for you. You are responsible for your own faith. And you need to understand that this call to follow Jesus, to live and love the way that King Jesus did, it also means that you can't do it by yourself. Following after Jesus is too big for us to do on our own. We're going to need help. That's where the church, that's where the body of Christ comes in. We, we strengthen each other. We encourage one another. We help one another. All those one another's that we see in the Bible. People tend to go to one extreme or the other, though. They either try to do everything themselves. I got it. Leave me alone. I don't need any help. Or the other side of that is they, they dump all the responsibility on somebody else. Hey, it's up to you to take care of me. It's up to the, the Bible study teacher or the pastor to make sure that I grow spiritually. It's their job. That's not right either. Both of these are wrong. The proper balance is to understand that you are responsible. You're responsible for you. And in order to be fully responsible for you, you've got to find support. You've got to find the proper support systems in your life and in your faith. There's a story about a, a little boy that was trying to fix his own bicycle. His chain had slipped off, and he was trying to get the chain back onto the sprocket so it would spin around. And if you've never done that before, you know that it can be pretty difficult. His, his father was there watching him try over and over again, watching the little boy struggle. And eventually, the little boy with his greasy finger said, Dad, I, I give up. I, I can't do this. I've done everything I can do, but I can't fix my bicycle. The dad looked at him kindly, and he said, I see, son. Have you asked for my help? No, the boy said. Well, then, you haven't done everything you can do. That's the balance we need to find. It's good for us to do what we can. It's even healthy for us to be responsible for ourselves. But we all must realize if we want to be all we can be, if we want to truly succeed, if we want to go farther in our faith, we will need a team beside us. You will need a team beside you. In Galatians, Paul instructs us with this. He says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. But then just a few verses later, Paul says this. 
Each one of you should carry his own load. Each one of you should carry your own weight. It's not an either or, it's a both and. You need to do both of these things. You need to find balance along the way. Yes, you are strong. Yes, you do what you can. Yes, you carry your own load. And you also need to be part of a team where at times you can lean on others, where at times others can lend you, lend you a hand and you can lend a hand to them as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul talks about the spirit of community that should be in every church. He talks about the kind of community that each of us wants and needs, each, that each of us can grow from. Church is not meant to be a group of people just sitting in rows and singing a few songs and listening to a really handsome guy talk. Why does that always, that always get to laugh? Oh, man. All right. <laughs> I know, I know it's going to get a laugh. Um, it's got to be more. It's got to be that community. It's got to feel like a team, like, like a family, like a body, like a, the Bible calls us a living organism, that we live together, we work together, we're like the parts of a body. We all come together and we're alive when we're connected together. Hardly a week goes by, though, that I don't talk to somebody who had a bad experience with church. Yeah, especially lately, it seems like half the conversations I have are about this, are about people that have been hurt by the church or hurt by people in the church. And I know that there's trouble out there, right? There, there are churches that don't provide the, the right kind of atmosphere for, for people to grow. Some churches... Well, they can chew people up and, and spit them out pretty quickly, right? And, and it's a shame. But it's also a fact. <laughs> like, 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 let's not kid ourselves. This is a fact of life. This is a fact of what it means to be part of something. You're going to be part of something. That means other people are going to be there, and they're going to be messy, and you're going to be messy, and your two messes might not mesh that well together, right? And anytime you get people together, whether they're Christians or not, there's a good chance, there's almost a guarantee that somebody's feelings are going to get hurt sooner or later. Somebody's feelings, somebody's toes are going to get stepped on. And one of my primary concerns for Anchor is that our church provides a loving atmosphere where people can come here and feel welcome and know that they are welcome, that they can come here and find strength and encouragement, that they can come here and find support as they struggle to follow Jesus, support as they try to build a stronger life and a stronger faith. And the reality is that means working through some issues together, right? That means saying, I'm sorry, that means looking out for one another, asking each other, how can I help? That means saying, you're still my brother or sister, even when we disagree. Okay, chapter 2. Chapter 2, there's three things I want to show you about what it looks like to strive to become uh, this kind of church, this kind of body of believers. There's, there's three things you want to look for in any community or team that you're a part of. Number one is this. Let's strive to be gentle with one another. Let's strive to be gentle. I see this in, in verse 7, chapter 2, verse 7. Paul says this. He says, we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her children or like a, a mother nursing her child. You know, originally the NIV, you remember the old NIV from the 70s and 80s that I memorized and then they changed stuff? This is one of the things they changed. They went back and said, you know, this verse is actually talking about a mother nursing her child, a mother nursing an infant. Now, can you imagine a scene more tender than that, more gentle, more nurturing than, than a mother and her child? Paul says, that's how gentle we were with you. That's how gentle you can be with one another. Now, ladies, I think a lot of you can imagine that. Most of the guys have no idea 
what that even means, that level of gentleness, right? I remember my first time being at a small group. Um, there's a lot of sound coming up over here. Dylan, can you go down there and like find a door to shut or something? Thank you, sir. I asked Dylan because he's young and strong. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this guy play uh, softball or not, but he's got some skills out there. He's got some skills. Thank you, Dylan. At our previous church, I went to a, a small group for the first time, and uh, I remember there was a, a young man there. He's probably, I don't know, 20, 21, something like that, and he, um, he was ready to go deep. He wanted to, to share his struggles. He was asking for help about some of the hardest things in his life. He, he was a dad. He was a, a non-custodial dad. He had had a, a couple kids when he was just a teenager, and now he was really struggling with what it meant to be a good dad. And, of course, there were lots of issues. There were custody problems and visitation problems and uh, struggles with the mom. And as he shared his heart, the, the, people, the people in that small group, they didn't give him advice. They didn't stop and pray for him. Instead, they, they went after him. They, they came down hard on this guy. And I, I didn't speak up. I was, <laughs> I was in shock. You know, I think I kind of wanted to see what was going to happen here. But instead of praying for this guy or, or trying to help him, they said things like, well, you know, you brought this on yourself. You know, if you hadn't made those decisions, you wouldn't be in this situation now. And that was true. You know, that's true. But he already knew that. He had already felt that and dealt with that for the last several years. His heart had been broken about that. What they were saying wasn't helpful to him. It, w it wasn't gentle or kind. It certainly wasn't productive. It didn't help him get any farther down the road. It didn't help him in his faith. He was really hurt. And later, I remember talking to him, and he just kind of said, you know, I, I get it. I know I made poor choices when I was young. I know there's going to be consequences for those choices. I, I just thought people would want to help. I just thought the folks at my church might be able to, to give me a little advice and a little compassion. We've got to be those kind of people. We've got to remember to be gentle with one another. I've got to remember that at some of our board meetings. <laughs> We've got to remember that, you know, when we're having Bible study together. We've got to remember that when we're doing service projects together. We've got to remember that when we're in the lobby together. We've got to remember that when we are online together. As brothers and sisters, we are kind. We care. The American church hasn't just struggled with this. It, it's failed. It's failed at this, especially in the last few years. We, we've lost our kindness. We've lost our gentleness. We've stopped leading with love. And instead of being kind to those that are different or, or kind to those on the outside, we've, we've lambasted them, right? And some churches, they, they, they get focused on success. They're going to do whatever it takes to, to grow and, and become successful, and, and they overlook people. They forget about people. Some churches focus on, on making sure everybody knows that they are more right than everybody else. Let me tell you how right we are. And they step on people as they do that. We've forgotten the importance of being tender, of being kind. And it's critical to me that the anchor knows this, that people can come here 
and know they won't be blindsided, but instead know that they will be kind, uh, cared for. Let's be gentle with one another. We can agree to disagree. Not everything is important. (laughs) We can lead with love and gentleness. Number two is this. Let's strive to encourage one another. Paul first said, uh, we were like a mother among you, like a mother with that child. Then in verse 12, he says this. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God. So uh, Paul is covering all the bases here. He's like a gentle, kind mother. Now he's like a father that encourages, that comforts, and that urges, right? That kind of wants to spur them forward into a life that's worthy of God. Here are some examples of of what encouragement can sound like, because some of you may have not heard it for a while. Encouragement sounds like some simple four-word phrases. You can do it. You can do it. Callie, you can do it. You can get through that senior year. You can do it. It might look like I will help you. How encouraging is that when you're overwhelmed, when you're overburdened, when you just feel like the weight is too heavy, when somebody comes up and says, I will help you. That's encouraging. Let's do this together. I believe in you. I believe in you. That's encouragement. All churches need a community and an atmosphere where this kind of message is taught. Seek out those kind of people. Seek out the the people who encourage you, not the ones that bring you down, not the ones that cause conflict in your life, but the ones who encourage you. And then think about how you can be that kind of person yourself. Are you the kind of person that encourages others? Be that kind of person. Be that kind of person in this community as well. Uh, The author William Ward said this, Flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. (laughs) Ignore me, and I may not forgive you. Encourage me, and I will not forget you. Encourage me. That encouragement has power. We don't have to pretend everything is rosy. I know it's not. I know when somebody's giving me that fake smile, I know there's things in the world that are causing huge trouble, right? But, but listen, the truth is that we must remember who it is that we serve. We must remember who it is that we're here for. We serve and follow a God that has power that knows no limits, that has love that knows no end. Mercy that knows no bounds. We have a God who is in charge. So let him be in charge of whatever it is you're struggling with. Let him be in charge of whatever it is that weighs your heart down. The world can feel pretty rough sometimes. And I know some of you are struggling even today, but I never want you to lose sight of the fact that God will turn a situation around. God can be in the middle of it. He can give you a victory even when it seems dark. You can live your life with hope. With hope. Hope breeds encouragement. Remember those words. You can do it. I will help you. I'll be there with you. We believe in you. That's the encouragement we need to hear. Everyone uh, at one time or another has probably had a, a coach I remember a couple football coaches uh, or a boss or or maybe even a parent that that just just beat you down with criticism, right? Just everything they said to you was negative. You're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. And that kind of discouragement breaks a person down. It makes you want to say, what's the use? Why, Why even try? We see the opposite of that from Paul. We see the opposite of that in the book of Thessalonians. Paul encouraged people, and so should we. Surround yourself with people who encourage you and strive to be an encourager yourself. Amen? Amen. Number three is this. Let's strive to enjoy one another. Enjoy one another. 
You know, after being in ministry for so many years, I've seen a lot of things in a lot of different churches. I've seen how things really work in a lot of churches. And they've been as different as night and day, right? I've been in churches where before the service, people come in and they're quiet and they sit down. You know, there's almost not a sound. Maybe there's a, a soft music playing in the background or not. But you might see a, a mother that whispers something to her kids. Says, sit down, sit down, be quiet. And I've been at other churches where it's exactly the opposite, right? Everybody's up. Everybody's talking. Everybody's got coffee in their hands. They're laughing. They're telling jokes. They're talking about what happened last week, and, and the worship leader has trouble getting the service started, right? The worship leader's like, hey, hey, we can start now. Everybody, let's start. But people are, are just enjoying each other. They're laughing together. Now, what attitude, what church do you think is more pleasing to the Lord? It's the second one for sure, Right? He wants us to enjoy each other. He wants us to love the relationships that we have with one another. He wants our fellowship, our time together to be full of life and happiness. That's why King David said this in Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. When we're together, when we're unified, it is good, it's pleasant, it's good to be together. This time is meant to be enjoyed when the body gathers. And Paul said something similar to the Thessalonians. He said this, verse 17, But brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, he's like, even when I'm away from you, I'm still thinking about you. Out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. Paul wanted to get back there. Verse 18 now, For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of the Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? You catch what he's saying there? He's like saying at the end of it all, on the day of days, when we all stand before Jesus, what's going to be important? What's going to matter? What will bring me joy? It's you. It's you and the relationship I have with you and the joy that you bring me and the joy that we have from each other knowing that we're together with Jesus. You are our joy. Paul, Paul just tells him, I, I want to be with you. I want to see you again, friends. I'm looking forward to it. You mean so much to me. And Anchor, wouldn't it be amazing if we could say those kind of things to each other? If when we bumped into each other through the week, we said, man, it's great to see you. I've been thinking about you. When we see each other at church, wow, I'm so glad you're here. It's good to see you, Tamara. I'm glad that you're here. We can say those things. We can enjoy one another. We can miss one another. We can laugh and have fun and celebrate together, right? God wants these things for us. He wants us to have joy and celebrations. That's what he wants. I think about all the festivals there is in the Bible, right? The Old Testament is just filled with all these festivals and feast days and holidays because God likes it when people get together and have fun. He wants us to get together and celebrate the good things. He wants us to be together and have joy from being together and have joy from being one with him. I want to build that kind of community here. That will make our church strong like a rock. That will make us the rock that we should be. Let me wrap up with this. The, the most solid people I know, the, the people who are, are wise and, and growing in their faith, the people that are, are, are joyful they're people that have these kind of deep spiritual connections. They're people that are, are rooted together. They're not trying to be a lone wolf. They have a support system in place. They're part of a community. They get together with people. And, and, and they enjoy being together with people. You know that, that old Western idea of the rugged cowboy that's off on his own and, and he's a standalone individual, I don't need anyone? Guys, that's a myth. That's a myth. 
That's not how people really work. (laughs) There's no lone rangers in our faith. There's no lone rangers that are growing closer to one another, that are growing closer in their way that they love God and love one another. Even the lone ranger had Tonto, right? If you want to grow like this, if you want to develop that character, if you want to be like a rock, that unshakable, determined rock of faith, then you've got to dive deep into community. You've got to get below the surface with people. You've got to be real with one another. And in the process of being real, be gentle, be encouraging, find the joy that you can share even when the disagreements arise. I want that to describe the people here. And if it doesn't, because sometimes it doesn't, I want you to be part of the reason that it changes. I want you to be part of the reason that it changes and makes Anchor better. Let Anchor be known for being gentle with one another, for encouraging one another, and for enjoying each other's company. Guys, we're in this together. We're a family. We're a team. Let's help one another be strong like a rock as we follow Jesus together. Amen? Thank you. All right, church. Um, Ken or Bob, do you want to turn the, the fans on? It's getting a little toasty up here anyway. I don't know how it is out there. Is it, is it warm out there or is it still cool? It's all right? All right. It's just all these rock star lights I got on me here. Got to light me up so I look good on camera. <laughs> Church, um, Thank you. I, I love you, and um, I'm, I'm happy to be part of this church. Uh, I love it when I get the chance to dive deeper with some of you. And there's a lot of folks here, right? Like, you can't go all in with everybody here. It, it just doesn't make sense. You wouldn't have time to sleep or eat or anything else. But you've got to have somebody. You've got to have a, a, a few somebodies that you're doing life with, that you're going deeper with, that you can enjoy each other and encourage each other and, and, and grow strong together. All right, church, we're going to switch now to uh, our sermon sequel time. Um, sermon sequel is, is something pretty cool that we do here at Anchor. Um, we get to hear from each other, and I, I want to hear what you guys have to say today. Um, This is an interesting one, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We've got some questions. Anybody can chime in and answer. Uh, Dustin will bring the microphone around so that we can all hear what you want to share with us. Uh, Just raise your hand up. Make sure you keep your answer like in the one to two minute range so that other people get a chance to chime in. Um, Folks watching online, you've got to use the microphone for them or or they can't hear anything about what's going on. So don't be afraid of that. Um, But let's talk together. Let's learn together. Number one is this. What are some practical ways that we can be more gentle with others? What does it look like in your life to be more gentle with others? What are are some ways that you could uh, make that happen this week? What are some, some... Changes you can make or or just ways to consider being gentle with one another. I see Echo right there. Echo, good to see you. Nice to see you. Well, I think um, slowing down the rat race in your brain and... Um, wow. around you and be humble. Like, I think that that's encouraging because when you do that, you can come to somebody gently and, you know what I mean? Yeah. And help them instead of worrying about what you're doing the next second, you know what I'm saying, or what you got <laughs> to do or your whole list of things. And 
this, that, and the other, those things will always be there, but the words of encouragement could last forever for somebody, you know what I mean? Yeah. Man, that's great, Echo. You, you said two really important things there, and I hope I can remember them. Um, but you said uh, slow down, right? Like if you're going to be gentle and kind to somebody, you've got to slow down the pace of your life. You can't be going 100 miles an hour or you're going to run somebody over, right? Uh, you've got to slow down your pace of life. You've got to actually you know, take your eyes and your thoughts off of yourself, uh, take a breath, start to think about others. You know, who needs some help today? How can I be uh, loving and kind to somebody today? Just slow down, which is good advice in a whole bunch of ways for our lives, right? We're all moving too fast, trying to do too much, stressed out all the time. Uh, and the other thing you said was, was to be humble, was to be humble. Um, really beautiful. I'm not sure who has a microphone now. David, David, what do you think? I think that for me, I have to pray and ask God to help me to understand what being gentle with others means first. Hmm. And because yeah. everybody's situation is a little bit different. Everybody's going dealing with something in their life. And you got to be able to meet them where they're at. And sometimes that's just listening. Sometimes it's offering more than just your ears. Sometimes it's actually physically helping them with something. Whatever it is, you got to listen and be attentive to what they're asking and what they're saying to you. Yeah. So. Great thoughts, David. Uh, slow down and, and, and pray about it. Um, cause if we're, you know, some of us aren't that good at this and, and some of us are really not good at this. Uh, so, so slow down and pray about it. God, God, what do you have in mind for me to do? God, how, what do you have in mind for me to, to help somebody or encourage somebody? Um, yeah, I see Kathy and Scott, uh, Sheila's got the oh, microphone. Yeah. Sheila, go ahead. Um, for me, a practical way is I think it was a first week of Mission Possible, you said uh, just inviting God in, like for a walk or at the work at the diner. I'm like, I'll go out back for a second and I'll just invite him to work with me. And yeah. I find myself doing that every day at some point, just invite him for a walk or. Wow. And it just makes it a lot easier for me to understand everybody else and Excellent, be more humble. Sheila. Excellent. Yeah, man, Sheila's in that little diner every day, man, with people all around. I'd be the same way. I'd be stepping out like every five minutes, uh, talking to God, trying to catch my breath. Um, so you bet. Uh, talk to the Lord. Slow down. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't need to say more there. Kathy. Okay, I would try to greet everybody with a smile first, then listen hmm. to them. And then by the time you get done talking to them, leave them with a positive thing to think about for the rest of the day. Man, all right, Kathy. Kathy, you need to come teach a seminar. That was, those are three great points. Great points, man. Uh, when you first interact with somebody, smile, lead with a smile. And then she said, actually listen to them, right? Like really listen and leave them with something positive. Whew, that's good stuff, Kathy. Really good. Uh, all right, we got lots of hands up now. Who's got the microphone? Me. There she is. Hi, Bree. So, um, a practical way we can be more gentle with others is to put yourself in their shoes. Mm -hmm. Try to understand where they are coming from. Be like, if if someone was gonna say to me what I'm about to say to them, how would I feel? <laughs> That's great. That great part. advice. Yep. Have some empathy going. Put yourself in other shoes. Um, think about how what you're about to say or communicate would feel if somebody said that to you. Really good stuff. Uh, Amanda and then Scott up here. Amanda, I just go wanted ahead. to just say that um, for my, my one church at Mentory Moms, after I got out of the Mentory Moms, I've been praying for everybody that is in need of prayer. Hmm. I just smile at them and say, Do you, would you like prayers? Yeah, that's excellent. Pray for one another, uh, especially when you know folks are, are going through something, when you know somebody's struggling. Don't be afraid to pray. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> I'm sure it's possible, but it's, it's hard to be harsh or angry with somebody when you're praying for them, right? Like pray, prayer just kind of automatically helps you settle down. Uh, think about the Lord and, and pray for somebody. 
as a way to be gentle. Scott, go ahead. Oh, Tracy, all right. I don't talk like that. I don't talk like you. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, boy, get it together. <clears throat> um, yeah, first of all, I have a problem slowing my brain down. I don't, that's a, I guess I get, uh, God would probably help me if I asked him to with that. But I'm uh, very selfish with uh, my time, I guess, and mm. feeling... Like, I'm worried about me and my feeling comfortable. And so um, it's weird, but I find it harder to be gentle, more gentle at home than with complete strangers. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, like, Vinny. Can, will, anybody else relate to that? Yeah. Yeah. But what is it? No. <laughs> Man. So I oh. feel like uh, like Vinny will be telling me about his work day, and I'm about ready to go, okay, just what <laughs> happened? <laughs> Tell me the, just, I don't need to know the name of the people, the where it happened at. Just tell me what happened. Hurry up. Tell me what happened. So, yeah, I need to just quiet my mind down to listen hmm. to him and not, just, yeah, not be so selfish with, with my time. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks. I, re I relate to what you're saying. Scott, go ahead. Moments ago, I was getting ready to speak, but Tracy told me she wanted to speak before I did, so I decided to be gentle <laughs> and let her do so. That, that's kind of what Tracy said. It's a, it, it, it resembles what Tracy said. When you asked the question, in case other people did not think of it, the first thing that came to mind was this thing called social media. Mm, yeah, yeah. Where gentleness is not often what's there. And there are way, <laughs> some of you who look at what I post, I try to be challenging, but I don't try to beat people up. There's a difference <laughs> uh, for me. And I think a lot of the people who are not gentle on social media, you don't have to be on social media, by the way. You can live your life completely independent of it. But if you're on social media, <laughs> often you're not gentle because you're starting to act like the other people on social media. Ah, mm -hmm. When if you go onto social media, I recommend acting like Jesus when you're there. Um, Second, yeah, well, th it pushes go ahead. people's buttons somehow, doesn't it? And it, it's so easy for things to get ramped up. And, and once somebody starts ramping it up, boy, you want to match their temperature, right? Oh, you're going to say that? I'm going to say this. And it escalates it, it quickly. It escalates quickly, yeah. Go ahead. The more profound thing I want to say is it's like I was listening to everyone. There's all this good stuff, and what did uh, somebody said something, and somebody said something else. Um, it was Echo. Echo started saying, slow down the rat race, and I said, oh, gentleness is a uh, big thing is moving more slowly. And then other people said wonderful things, and my major insight that I'm about to share with you now is that a practical way we can become more gentle with others is to learn how gentle God is with mm. us. Excellent, yes. Because God does not beat me up. God takes his time with me. God is not behind me pushing me. There, there are some ways that God gives me a kick in the butt, <laughs> but it kind of tends to be a gentle kick in the butt. Yeah. I think God's very gentle with me. If I thought about that more, I might learn to be more gentle with others. That's all for me. Excellent. Uh, Wesley, right beside you. Um, yeah, great thought, Scott. Uh, consider, dwell on, uh, think about how God is with you, his gentleness with you, uh, and then try to share that with others. Uh, after Wesley, we're going to go to question two, and I'm going to give just five people a chance to answer question two. Uh, but uh, first, Wesley, what do you think? One of the things I know I do very poorly at is to make sure you do lots of question asking. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Instead of making statements and making opinions, ask questions to have the other person respond. 
And then when you do that, don't wait so that you can respond. You're waiting for your turn. <laughs> Instead of waiting for your turn, yeah, wait, don't just wait, wait for your to turn. ask another question. Um, another thing that, again, struggle with terribly, which has been taught, but how long does it take something to ingrain into your brain, even though you've heard it, is to speak in a way that's soft enough that you have to repeat yourself. Hmm. Hmm. You're going to be, you're not going to sound loud and angry if you have to repeat yourself because you were so gentle in the way that you spoke. If you have to say it again, okay. your tone's going to be quieter. It's going to so be you gentler. Can, you can change the whole hmm. temperature and attitude of the conversation literally with your tone of voice, yeah. with the tone and volume yeah, of your voice. It's, yeah. you know, we could probably bear to read <laughs> Proverbs a little bit more <laughs> and yeah. see what the Lord spoke through Solomon and many others. But. Thank you, Wesley. Um, great advice there. Ask questions. Seek first to understand and then be understood. Uh, I want to take just a, a few people uh, for number two. I felt like this might be uh, important today. Uh, but who do you want to encourage? Uh, you know, we'll give you a microphone, and, and you can encourage somebody. Uh, you can use these words. You can do it. I will help you. I believe in you. Uh, you can use your own words, but uh, who do you want to encourage today? I saw a few. Uh, Kathy's got the mic, and, and Bev, and Becky, and David, and Steve. All right, Kathy. Okay, I would like to encourage everybody in here because I'm sure everybody's got uh, a problem and yeah. I'm going to say I believe in you, believe in you, and everybody can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I believe in you. Becky. See, here I go. I can't even talk. But I try to encourage my grandbabies. Yeah. And the other night, she was home for a couple days. So the other night, we went to Lake Offs. And our food came. And I said, you know what? I just want to pray. So we all held hands. You know, here we are in this bar on the family <laughs> side. And Becky's trying to pray. But Kevin, my problem is I cried so hard during that prayer. But, you know, I just thank God every day for keeping that little girl safe. And in New York City, you have no idea what's going to happen. And so anyway, I was a sobbing, and finally I just said, in Jesus' name, I pray, amen. And when I opened my eyes, these two kids were looking at me like, has <laughs> grandma gone off the deep end? So how can I get, how can I get myself that I don't, I mean, I cannot even talk about Emma to anybody. You know, Becky, I, I, they see what's behind that. E even if they only understood, uh, you know, 30% of what you were trying to say in your prayer, they, they know the heart behind that. Uh, and that, that is encouraging, right? They know, that, they know that grandma loves them, that grandma is concerned for them, that grandma wants the best for them. You know, and e even if they only heard, dear God and amen at the end, they got the message. They got well, the message. Well, I certainly hope so. <laughs> but I have to somehow stop just crying over here. <laughs> um, Bev and David and Steve, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Adds more emphasis when you cry. <laughs> I like to encourage whoever the Lord puts on my mind hmm. for that day. You know, like um, the other day, um, Sue came to my mind. So I just hmm. texted her. So, Thanks haven't you. heard from you lately, any place on social media or anything else. So what's up and how are you doing? And she's in a very low spot. And so I told the tribe, I said, we need to send cards. We need to encourage. But, you know, to do that... I kind of had to know the story behind Sue. I had mm. to know that she's lost some grandchildren mm -hmm. lately. And 
you know, and now she's sitting with a sick daughter-in-law, you know, and that very sick daughter-in-law. That's right. And, and our, as a family, we need to encourage the people in our family for sure, but then pay attention to your neighbors, too, who's struggling. You know, how can you encourage them? So I try to just, whoever the Lord puts on my mind, you know, there's so-and-so, okay, you know, or haven't seen this one, you know, and um, I don't know, sometimes I think I might drive people nuts because he does that to me, you know, <laughs> get involved in a lot of things, but it's because I care, you know, and the Lord's telling me to encourage people or check up on people or yeah, take care it, of it people. Can be, it can be yeah. simple things, absolutely. Yeah, so I don't yeah. mean to drive anybody nuts, but, you know, I do intend to do what God <laughs> wants me to do, you know what I mean? And that, so just Thank take you, a little longer, and if somebody comes to mind, and I think we should have more events at church so that we learn the stories of the people around mm -hmm. here, and, and you know, because like, so if the Lord put Leon on my mind, you know, but I don't know anything about Leon. There's no lead-in as to why I would contact Leon, you know, or say, how are you doing in this, you know, because I don't know the story, you know what I mean? And that, so I think more fellowship is even important to learn each other's stories. Yeah. Thank you, Bev. Uh, David and Steve. Well, I'm going to argue with Bev. <clears throat> oh, all right. Here we and go. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a rebel and jump to number three. Can we agree to disagree? And talk about the anchor celebration. And to me, this is it right now, right hmm. here. And I would say hmm. that for a body this small, we probably know more about one another and what hurts and what brings joy than most any church family anywhere, because we dare to do this and speak to one another. Thank you, David. That's encouraging to me. And it should be encouraging to all of you as well. Because um, it's not easy, right? It's not easy to, to be real with each other. It's not easy to, to really know somebody and still really love them, right? Like that, that's the kind of love that God puts in our heart for one another. Um, so it keeps us dependent on him. Steve, you get last word, and you can even bring the microphone back up when, because uh, I know the band's going to come back up too, man. What do you, I would like to encourage think? you and your family. You Thanks. people don't understand what all Kevin and Tia, Trey and Chloe go through. Um, you know, week after week, they come in early, get things done behind the scenes. Um, you know, stay up late at night praying for people, talking to people. You know, Kevin works another job besides this church. I mean, these people have their hand on God's pulse, and I really think that we need to pray for, for Kevin. We really need to encourage him to be the man that he needs to be and, and the servant of God that he is. And we, I do appreciate you and do encourage you in that regard. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, brother. And uh, thank you uh, for those that have been praying for Tia and her mom uh, as well. We appreciate that um, and the support there, too. All right, Anchor, we get, a, we get a sing together. So we've got one song here for you, and uh, I'll let Logan take over from here, but let's stand together. Yeah, I just, I think we can use praise as an encouragement for each other. That's what I was thinking about how, like, how can we encourage each other? When we're, when we're praising God and we're singing these songs, we're not just singing it for ourselves. We're not just singing it for God. We're singing it for each other. We're testifying. God is holy. He has the power to change my heart. He can change your life, too. And I think, let's use this next song as an opportunity to encourage each other. When we sing, others see each other singing. We're testifying that we believe what we're seeing, that we're believing this truth.
maybe. Somebody man the key hit four space bar on the keyboard there. Trey. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. Hey Trey, on iMac, can you hit four space? what the enemy meant for evil and he turned it for good let's encourage each other in that let's testify to that this morning you take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it for good turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it for good Turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna 
sing a victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna sing a victory i'm gonna sing a victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna sing a victory i'm gonna sing a victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna sing a victory i'm gonna sing a victory for the battle belongs to you lord you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good and you turn it for good Amen church Great job, worship team. Thank you so much. Anchor Church, I love you. I want to encourage you, and I want to bless you, and I want to celebrate and have some joy and some fun with you too. So now may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you. Have a great week.